Kings and Generals is proud to announce that this is one of the many incredible channels that we've partnered up with for Project Ukraine. Project Ukraine is a playlist dedicated to telling the past of the Ukrainian people to aid them in the present. Your likes, shares and donations to the charity we're collaborating with will have a direct impact in aiding the most vulnerable citizens of Ukraine. We have partnered up with the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kyiv, which was bombed by the Russian troops at the start of the invasion. Today, the Foundation has transformed its projects, refocusing its resources and efforts on purchasing and delivering humanitarian aid to civilians and evacuating people from combat zones. In the first week of April, the center provided over 7,000 food baskets to patients and doctors at Kyiv hospitals, to bomb shelters in the Kyiv underground, as well as to people with disabilities and elderly people who cannot leave their homes. They also provided targeted assistance to 3,354 people, delivering specific medications, food and hygiene products on individual requests. We hope that viewers would consider donating to this noble cause and help with the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. In the last few months, we've all become very familiar with this map, or one showing Russian attacks, and thankfully, recent Ukrainian counterattacks of Russian forces have been pushed from the north of the country. But another important map to look at in terms of Ukraine is this one, a linguistic map, in this case showing those speakers who consider Russian as their native language. And in this video, I want to ask why are there so many people, actually around a third of people in Ukraine, who consider Russian to be their first language? A quick note that if you want to find out exactly how Russian and Ukrainian are different, then Langfocus has a great video which I will link as well. If we take another look at the linguistic situation and look at languages spoken in the Ukrainian homes outside of various minority languages, we can see a certain pattern. Noting that that orange section Surzhik is a kind of mixed language between Ukrainian and Russian, although defining it is a little bit difficult, as in Ukrainian, Surzhik can be any mixed language whether with Russian or not. Although this map shows a kind of language that uses some features and words of Ukrainian and some of Russian both together. In general, when looking at this map, we can make a distinction between three zones of Ukraine. Western Ukraine, where Ukrainian is dominant. Central Ukraine, where there is a kind of mixed language of Ukrainian spoken, particularly in the rural areas, whilst the cities speak Russian. And the South and East, where Russian is by far the dominant language. It's also worth bearing in mind that the vast majority of first language Ukrainian speakers can also speak Russian as a second language. And whilst it's clear that our first language can influence how we speak a second language, it's also true that knowing a second language quite well can also influence our first language. And this is probably how Surzhik has come about, but also why it's sometimes difficult to define whether someone is a native Ukrainian speaker or a native Russian speaker. Now in 2001, a survey found that around 30% of people considered Russian to be their first or native language. And when they were asked what their ethnic identification was, we found that the majority of Russian speakers were people who described themselves as ethnic Russians, a lot of the time with Russian ancestors and who felt a certain connection with Russian culture. Around five and a half million were Ukrainians, people who identify as Ukrainian with Ukrainian ancestors, but who speak Russian as a first language. And following them, there were smaller minorities of people who were Belarusians or Jews or Greeks, etc., who also spoke Russian. Now, to simplify this into another chart, we have obviously the majority being ethnic Russians, followed by Ukrainians, and a smaller group, around a million, of people who were ethnic minorities who speak Russian as their first language. Now, this has actually been politicized in the past, particularly by Russian propagandists who seek to create a link between those who speak Russian as a first language and wanting to belong to Russia. And this was, in fact, the rationale behind the occupation of Crimea in 2014, that Russian speakers there were being discriminated against, were in danger, even that genocide was being committed against Russian speakers, and that is why the Russians had to invade. Fears over attacks on Russian speakers also fueled the break breakaway republics in the Donbass region. More on that in this video. But how and why are Russian and Ukrainian different? Because surely they both are very similar, so what does it matter about Russian and Ukrainian speakers? 
Well, first, let's take a look at the collective history of both languages. Now, Ukrainian and Russian are indeed different languages, and they have quite a few differences, both in terms of their makeup in words, as well as their grammatical structures and other features. But both are descended from a common ancestral language, which is usually called Old East Slavic, to which, of course, also Belarusian is another of the descendants. Now, Old East Slavic makes up part of the Slavic language family, and to give you a very much simplified tree of the Slavic languages, you can see there's Old East Slavic with Ukrainian and Russian, there's the South Slavic languages spoken mostly in the Balkans, and also the West Slavic languages, which include languages like Polish, like Czech and Slovak, Kashubian, Silesian, etc. So they're all related languages and so they often share similar features, although they are also different in their own ways, which makes them different languages. Now, Old East Slavic was spoken in an area called the Rus state, which was initially populated by Old Norse speakers who would intermarry and culturally become more similar to the Slavic peoples they ruled over and with until they took over the Slavic language as well, this Old East Slavic language. Now, the Rus would eventually be conquered and divided by the Mongols, who took over the Eastern Rus state, whilst the Western Rus state would eventually be incorporated and conquered by the Duchy of Lithuania, later to be the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And this division politically also brought a linguistic division as well. Now, generally speaking, that area in the West, which fell under the Duchy of Lithuania, became Ukrainian speakers, whilst those in the East became Russian speakers. That is to simplify it somewhat, but it's in essence, this is how the two language divided in its initial phase. This was because under different political circumstances, as well as geographic circumstances, they had different influences acting upon that same language to then make them different. So for example, the Eastern Rus, so in the area of what is today Russia, was heavily influenced by the written language of Old Church Slavonic. It was written by the clerical classes, hence why it's called Church Slavonic, so a little bit like Latin in the West for the Orthodox peoples was more like Old Church Slavonic, and this had an influence on the spoken language as well. Furthermore, later on, during the reign of Peter the Great, when Russia was attempting to modernize and become a more modern European country, there were also many borrowings from French, which was a very important learned language across Europe at the time, as well as scientific borrowings from Latin. There were also borrowings from other European languages like German, English and Dutch because of military and cultural connections as well. On the other hand, if we take a look at the Western Rus, so what would become Ukrainian, we can see there is a lot more influence from the spoken vernacular language rather than from this written church Slavonic language. So there were more colloquialisms in there. Furthermore, because of their occupation by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the geographic proximity of Polish speakers and rural Polish communities, lots of Polish words also entered Ukrainian, particularly in Western Ukrainian dialects, speaking of course about the region of Lviv, called Lvuf in Polish, because this actually was a part of Galicia, which was part of Poland for a long time. And so Polish vocabulary and influence can be found a lot more in Ukrainian. So that is how you get a different Russian and Ukrainian language, despite the fact that they are very closely related to one another being part of that same East Slavic branch. But then how do we get speakers of Russian, when it's clearly defined, living in Ukraine, an area where beforehand in this earlier medieval period, we found Ukrainian speakers? Well, let's dig into that as well. For a large part of the Middle Ages and indeed the early modern period, we might best conceive of Ukraine as being the Wild East of Europe. So like the Wild West, fairly lawless, fairly uninhabited in large parts with roving bands of different peoples living there, often on horseback. These were wide open fields and often are called the Wild Fields. Now to the south in the region of Crimea, a Mongol a descended group came to power. This was known as the Crimean Khanate, and they would over time extend their influence and power into the wild fields, although it largely remained uninhabited for a long time. 
Now, there were also influences coming from the West. As I mentioned, there was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth there, which would exert influence. To the East, you had the Duchy of Moscow, which would become, of course, the Russian state in time. And in the middle, often fleeing and fighting against both, you had people that you might call some kind of proto-Ukrainians. These were the Cossacks. In particular, the Zaporzhian Cossacks who would create a hetmanate or a state in that central region. And they largely spoke the Ukrainian language in the middle there. Following the defeat of the Tatars at the hands of the Russian Empire and indeed with Cossack allies, more Ukrainian peasants from the West entered a region called Sloboda Ukraine, which means something like the borderlands of Ukraine. And after the Ukrainian peasants had settled there, others from further north, Russian-speaking peasants, also came and settled into this region. This was the first large-scale migration of Russian speakers into what is today Ukraine. They transformed this area from being wild and uninhabited steppe into more of an agricultural region. And it's in this region that the city of Kharkiv would later be founded. Now, in 1654, this area became a part of the Russian Empire, and large parts of Ukraine, in fact, almost all of Ukraine, would eventually be absorbed into the Russian Empire. To keep it safe from further Tatar raids, and indeed later against Cossack attacks, the Russians sent garrisons of Russian-speaking soldiers. But it's likely these were only a few thousand, so their number and influence shouldn't be overestimated, at least in this period. There was also a migration of Russian speakers into an area that the empire called New Russia, as it had recently been captured from the Crimean Tatars and against the Ottomans, as Crimea later would also be captured. They moved into this region and became a significant part of the population here, as the area hadn't before been thoroughly settled. In 1772, at the first partition of Poland, most of Ukraine would fall under the sway of the new Russian Empire, whilst the region in the very west of what is today Ukraine became part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, although a large part of this Galicia was actually inhabited by Polish-speaking people and had been considered part of Poland proper rather than Ukraine, but that's a story for another time. With its incorporation into the Russian Empire, new cities were founded across Ukraine, particularly in the south and in the east, which had been the uninhabitable wild steppelands of the wild fields. Now, these new cities required a population, and so the Russians brought in many of their own people, both peasants but also soldiers to protect them to stop any uprisings from happening, bureaucrats of the empire, and also brought limited industry to these regions, for which they needed also workers to come and work in these new mines and steel mills. These cities, which all have Ukrainian names here, also got other names by these new Russian inhabitants. So, for example, Kiev became Kiev, Kharkiv became Kharkov, Luhansk became Lugansk, Mykolaiv became Nikolaev, and so on and so forth. Many of these cities became bastions of Russian speakers, while the peasants in the surrounding rural areas mostly continued to speak Ukrainian. There are several explanations for why the cities became majority Russian-speaking. Partially because new cities being founded were largely being populated by ethnic Russians being brought in by the government. They also wanted people to be loyal to them, and so by adding Russians from the motherland, they could ensure this. The cities were also more likely to be connected by road and rail networks with Russia itself, and so Russian culture also came to these places, drawing people further into a Russian milieu. It wasn't only Russians that inhabited these new cities, however, as many Ukrainians also came to these cities following a broader trend of urbanization. These Ukrainian-speaking peasants would then come into a Russian cultural milieu where most people were speaking Russian, and indeed a state where the official language was Russian and the language of advancement was also Russian. So actually, some of the greatest 
Russian writers of Russian literature actually spoke Ukrainian as a first language or came from Ukraine. But because Russian was the main language of empire, it became important if you wish to advance socially that you spoke Russian. And so many original Ukrainian speakers switched to speaking Russian, particularly in these cities where there was a large social pressure to do so. By adopting the Russian language, they were better able to fit in with the society and the culture at the time. This was also paralleled by a state policy known as Russification in which the Russian Empire actively tried to get Ukrainian speakers to switch to speaking Russian. For one, they wanted, they didn't recognize the fact that Ukrainian was its own language. Because of course it's quite similar to Russian, they instead thought it was a kind of bastardized Russian that better education could teach them to speak Russian properly. They also somewhat feared that if the Ukrainian language were allowed to continue unabated, it might lead to the formation of national identity, which could lead to rebellion and demands for secession. This of course happened a lot in Poland, which had also fallen for a large part under Russia's sway during this period. Now, they referred to Ukrainian and Ukrainians as Little Russian based on the fact that they are similar languages, and what they tried to do was to enforce Russian by making it the only language of state education, and so that children going to schools would pick up Russian rather than Ukrainian, which was most likely still spoken at home. They also banned state education in the Ukrainian language in order to further suppress it. In the middle of the 19th century, Ukrainian language books were entirely banned, as were song lyrics and other poetry in the Ukrainian language, in an order to further stamp out Ukrainian and instead replace it with Russian. I should note that the repression of the Ukrainian language did fluctuate at times in the Russian Empire, so that ban on song lyrics was eventually overturned as well, but for the most part, Russian Empire's policy to the Ukrainian language was an attempt to drive it out, to completely remove it from Ukraine and get people to start speaking Russian instead. Now, this of course happened as well with the fact that the Ukrainian people would see that Russian speakers were socially and politically more powerful than they were. And so by switching language, they were able to get into that world to further advance themselves. And so this added pressure is likely also a reason that many Ukrainians started to speak Russian instead. And in fact, if we look at the 1897 census, we can see at this point that around 10% of the population of Ukraine were speaking Russian proper at this point. Now in 1917, of course, the Russian Empire would collapse with the Russian Revolution. The Bolsheviks would take over and for a short period, Ukraine would become semi-independent with various semi-independent states rising and soon falling to the communists. Now in 1918, the Soviet Union, which would take over Ukraine, announced its language policy, which was in fact quite a liberal language policy in terms of minority languages, in that it stated that the language of education could be the language of most of the people. And so this meant that in Ukraine, Ukrainian could now be used as a language of education. They in fact did this to further rally non-Russian minorities to the communist banner, particularly during the Civil War years, in order to integrate them in the new USSR. However, at the same time, Russian remained the de facto lingua franca of the Soviet Union, and that kind of cultural and social pressure to switch to speaking Russian that had existed during the Russian Empire continued during the Soviet period, despite official periods in which it was allowed to use Ukrainian as state education. Under Stalin, for example, this was largely overturned and Russian was put forward. However, later under Khrushchev, it came back that local minority languages were allowed to be used once again. Despite this official language policy, particularly the early Soviet period was incredibly hard for Ukraine and Ukrainian speakers. Many Ukrainian speakers would perish during the Holodomor, a famine created by Soviet authorities to kill its Kulak class. Furthermore, during the Second World War, many rural peasants would either be killed by both the Red Army and by the Germans, as well as by diseases and malnutrition. 
This added on to the fact that many of the industrial cities in Ukraine were completely obliterated during the Second World War. And in order to fill the gaps in manpower, the Soviet Union would send many Russian workers from its own bustling cities in the west of Russia to repopulate these Ukrainian cities, particularly those industrial cities that could be found in the Donbass as well as other regions. This explains that even more Russian speakers entered Ukraine during this time, while many Ukrainian speakers were killed or displaced. That sort of explains why in 2001, the census found that around 30% of people were considering Russian to be their native language. Ukrainian continued to be repressed and more Russian speakers from Russia emigrated to Ukraine during the Soviet period. Now in 1991, Ukraine became independent. And for the first time, the Ukrainian language became the official language of a state. The Ukrainian constitution of 1996 vowed that the country would not become bilingual officially, that Ukrainian would be the only official language. However, it did also enshrine the protection of rights of speakers of minority languages, including Russian, which was spoken, of course, by huge numbers of people in the east and south of the country, although this would not be at an official level. Despite the Ukrainian government moving to promote Ukrainian as the official language of the country, a study from 2009 found that 52% of people in Ukraine used Russian as their language of communication, as opposed to 41% who used used Ukrainian as their language of most communication, with eight people using a mixture, or eight percent, not eight people, using a mixture of both languages. Now to explain this, we can kind of understand that most people who speak Ukrainian can also speak Russian as a second language. But most Russian speakers in Ukraine don't speak Ukrainian as well as Ukrainian speakers speak Russian. That is to say, first language or native language speakers. And so if in a group of eight Ukrainian speakers, there is one native language Russian speaker, then perhaps the more common thing to occur is that those eight people will switch to Russian because this is easier, as the mutual intelligibility from Ukrainian to Russian is easier than the other way around, as well as the fact that, as I mentioned, those Ukrainian speakers will often speak Russian better than that native language Russian speaker will speak Ukrainian. Of course, that is to largely oversimplify things once again, but it can explain that while there are more people who speak Ukrainian as their first language in Ukraine, Russian is actually used more frequently as a language of communication. Now in 2012, it, the law was passed that said that if 10% of people in an oblast, that is to say a region of Ukraine, spoke a minority language, then this language would become a recognized regional language. Now, this, of course, is the case for many regions across Ukraine. In fact, I think that almost every oblast, apart from some in the West, would then be forced to add Russian as a another language alongside Ukrainian because of the large Russian-speaking minority. However, in 2014, the somewhat liberalization of these language laws in Ukraine took a drastic turn based on several events. The first were the Euromaidan protests, which ousted the pro-Russian government and instead installed a pro-Western one. The new government feared, and not entirely without reason, that Russian language broadcasts, especially those emanating from neighboring Russia, were being used to spread propaganda into Russian-speaking areas, including fears that a genocide would be carried out against speakers of the Russian language, something for which there is no evidence that the Ukrainian government had planned and at that time. It also became one of the main reasons for the justification that Putin gave for the annexation of Crimea, that because this was a largely Russian-speaking region with many ethnic Russians, it belonged into to be in Russia, and that's why he annexed the region and also instigated a war in the east in the Donbass, where the mass majority of people were also Russian speakers. 
It should be noted, however, that while there is a connection between language, ethnic identity and nationality, they are not one and the same, which is something that Putin and Russian propaganda frequently claim. As I mentioned at the start of this video, while around 8 million of the Russian speakers in Ukraine are ethnic Russian, 5.5 million, that's 6.5 million if you include minorities, are Ukrainians who speak Russian. Clearly, they are not even ethnically Russian. However, even those ethnic Russians might have an ethnic Russian background, but that doesn't make them Russian citizens or necessarily makes them support Russia as a state, as has become abundantly clear, as for example in the Ukrainian army, Russian is often used as a lingua franca, again because it's the language that most people are able to understand and communicate in. However, these fears have also been played up somewhat by Ukrainian authorities, as from 2017 to 2018, several of these language policies were felt by some to unfairly target Russian speakers in Ukraine. For example, they banned books that had been published in Russia from coming into Ukraine, which made up around 60% of literature read in Ukraine, as a lot more is published in Russian than in Ukrainian. However, it's clear to note that they didn't ban Russian language literature, only language, uh, only publications that had come from Russia itself. In 2017, another law was introduced that meant from the fifth grade on, all education in Ukraine would happen in Ukrainian, despite whether students in the school would be Russian language speakers uh, primarily, uh, or whether they were Ukrainian language speakers. This, of course, hasn't done much to assuage certain fears about a crackdown on the Russian language, although it has also been defended by saying people in Ukraine should be able to speak Ukrainian and therefore education should be provided in that language. There's also the fact that in 2018, remember following uh, several years of war in the Donbass and deteriorating relations with Russia, that various oblasts in the region, uh, here it's Kherson, Mykolaiv and Kharkiv, have all removed Russian as that minority regional language. And in 2018, the earlier law from 2012, about 10% of an oblast speaking a language, was also overturned. So language is certainly heavily politicized in Ukraine and it's been used by both Russia as an excuse as well as by Ukrainian government using it as a means to further the Ukrainian language. Now in 2022, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there have already been quite a few people, at least on the news and in certain other informal measures, saying that they have stopped speaking Russian because they were first language Russian speakers and to show solidarity have started to instead speak Ukrainian. And it'll be interesting to see in further studies and in uh, various censor that are done whether there will indeed be a large drop in Russian speakers in Ukraine and people switching over to Ukrainian as political events do often have an impact on language because language is so often politicized. However, at the same time, I can't but feel sorry for some of the Russian speakers in Ukraine as they have become so politicized by often no fault of their own simply for the language that they speak. Let me know in the comments below, what do you think? Do you think the Ukrainian government is right to pursue Ukrainization policies in order to stop a kind of fifth column and to create a more united nation as they see it, or simply to overturn many of the wrongs that had been done to Ukrainian speakers by the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union? Or do you think that they should become more relaxed with their language policy and allow people to speak and read literature in the language that they want? Let me know in the comments below what you think. I am, as ever, would be very much interested to hear your thoughts on the matter. Quick shout out to all the other channels that have worked together on Project Ukraine. We have a fantastic charity that we're supporting with the uh, money that we're receiving from these videos. And I would highly urge that if you can and you would like to, that you go and donate to the charity yourselves, as this would greatly help out the people that need it most right now in Ukraine and they are doing great work on the ground. There will be a link in the description, of course, so you can check out where your money will be going, what they're doing with it, and who you will be helping with this.
let me know would you like to see more videos on the situation in Ukraine as it pertains to language. I was thinking of perhaps doing a languages of Ukraine video just as I've done a languages of the British Isles and of uh, Spain as well. So thank you all very much for watching. I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.